Welcome to the deep dive. Today we're tackling a, well, a pretty mind bending question. What if everything we thought we knew about when humans first arrived in the Americas was off by like thousands of years and all because of one single ancient bone? It sounds incredible, doesn't it? But that's exactly what we're digging into. We're looking at some cutting edge forensic paleontology focused on this uh, remarkable giant ground sloth bone from Uruguay. It's dated to about 33,000 years old. Okay, 33,000 years. And our main source for this is a study, right? Published recently. Yeah, exactly. It's a detailed paper in the Swiss Journal of Paleontology by Richard Farina and his colleagues just out in 2025. We'll be drawing heavily on that and some related research they discussed. Got it. So our mission today really is to unpack the evidence on this bone. It sounds compelling, but maybe still a bit tentative. That's a good way to put it. Compelling, but tentative. We want to understand the uh, the scientific detective work, you know, how they figured this out, and really explore what it could mean for the whole story of humans and megafauna in the Americas. Absolutely. It could rewrite some key chapters. All right, let's get into it. Tell us about the specific bone, the one that started it all. Okay, so the artifact itself is a right calcaneus. That's the heel bone. And it belonged to a giant ground sloth, the species listed on Armatus, the specimen number is CAV45, if you're keeping track. Lestodon armatus. Yeah. Huge animal, right? And where was it found? Found at the Arroyo de Vizcaino site. That's in southern Uruguay. And like you said, the age is key. It's dated to approximately 33,000 calibrated years ago. 33,000. That date really stands out because the uh, the previously accepted timeline for humans in South America was much later, wasn't it? Much later, generally speaking. This really pushes things back significantly. And the context is important, too. This bone wasn't alone. It was found in this incredibly dense bone bed. We're talking over 2,000 megafaunal remains. Wow. Yeah, and most of them are also Lestodon armatus. The site's chronology is pretty solid, too, based on 12 different radiocarbon dates that all cluster around 30,000 radiocarbon years ago, which calibrates to over 33,000 actual years. Okay, so an ancient sloth heel bone found in a massive bone graveyard. But... What's special about this one? What's the mark everyone's talking about? Right. The key feature is this deep, uh, very circular, almost cone-shaped depression on the bone's surface. It's quite precise in its dimensions, too. About 21 millimeters across, so less than an inch, but nearly 41 millimeters deep. That's over an inch and a half deep into solid bone. Deep. And what did it look like up close, the characteristics? Well, the entry edges were smooth, which is interesting. <laughs> and inside, they found conchoidal fractures. Conchoidal, like when you chip flint, that kind of shell shape? Exactly like that. Those fractures are uh, really strong indicators of a very forceful impact, something penetrating thick cortical bone with a lot of energy. Okay, so definitely not just some random post-mortem damage. This sounds like it needed serious investigation. What kind of techniques did they use? They brought out the big guns, scientifically speaking. First, CT scanning. Like a medical CT scan. Pretty much, yeah, but optimized for bone. It gave them incredible 3D detail, not just of the surface marks, but the inside of the bone, too. They could create these detailed 3D reconstructions of the whole wound. Okay. Then they did something really clever. They made a silicone cast of the internal wound cap. Now cast? Why do that if you have the CT scan? Because the cast gives you a physical replica you can examine under a microscope. It can potentially reveal super fine details, textures, maybe even residues that might be harder to resolve perfectly on a CT image. It's painstaking work getting that cast just right. I bet. So you get this high-res physical model of the whole. What did that detailed analysis actually show? Well, looking closely at the cast, they found these fine parallel striations inside the cavity, little lines. Striations, like right. tool marks. Sort of, yeah. yeah. They weren't random scratches. The pattern suggested that whatever went in, it rotated and maybe shifted sideways a bit as it was inserted and pulled out. The thinking is these marks were probably made during the impact by crushed bone fragments getting smeared along the inside wall of the hole as the object went in. Okay, that makes sense. And residues, you mentioned residues. That's often the smoking gun, isn't it? It can be, absolutely. <laughs> and they did find organic residues lodged inside that indentation, specifically plant material. Things like cellulose, sieve cells, even lignified woody tissue. Stuff from plants. Woody tissue. So like from a wooden spear or something. Exactly. It strongly suggests that residue from the tool itself got transferred into the wound. Maybe a wooden shaft or perhaps what they call a whisker-hardened tip. Whisker-hardened? What's that? It's a technique, maybe using heat or chemicals, to make wood incredibly dense mm. and hard. Almost like a natural composite material. Super tough. 
Interesting. Any animal material found? They did find animal-derived collagen fibers, too. Now, some of that could easily be from the sloth itself, right, from the bone and tissue. But it's also possible some could have come from the tool if the point was made of, say, bone or ivory instead of wood. Okay, so you have the mark, the striations, the residues. What about when this happened? Did the injury occur when the sloth was alive or long after it died? That was crucial to determine. The evidence points very strongly to a paramortem injury, meaning it happened around the time of death. Uh -huh. They looked at the fracture edges, which were sharp. They saw how the cortical bone was kind of folded inward at an obtuse angle. And importantly, there was absolutely no, no sign of healing. No bone regeneration. None at all. No woven bone, which is what forms quickly when bone starts to heal. So this injury happened either just before, during, or very shortly after the animal died. It definitely wasn't old damage, and it wasn't something that happened long after death when the bone was dry and brittle. Okay, that pins down the timing. So with this really unusual paramortem injury, the next big step is ruling out other potential causes, right? Before you can even start thinking about humans. Exactly. You have to eliminate all the other plausible and even some less plausible explanations. That's fundamental to this kind of forensic work. So what were the main alternatives they considered? Like other animals? Definitely. Big predators were around back then. Saber-toothed cats like Smilodon populator and giant short-faced bears, Arctotherium. But their teeth leave different kinds of marks, usually more elliptical or puncture-like, matching their tooth shape, not this clean, circular, cone-shaped hole. And could a Smilodon even bite through a massive sloth heel bone like that? Probably not without breaking its own canine, frankly. That bone is incredibly robust. Plus, you expect to see other marks, maybe from the opposing jaw or other teeth. There was nothing like that. So carnivore bite. Ruled out. Okay, makes sense. What about the sloth injuring itself? Could it have stepped on its own tooth or claw in some freak accident? They considered that too. But the sloth's own form teeth, they actually lack enamel, believe it or not. They're relatively fragile and have this sort of triangular shape and cross-section. They wouldn't make this kind of mark or fracture pattern. And the claws. They were huge, weren't they? Huge, yes. But they're bone covered by a keratin sheath, like our fingernails, but much bigger and tougher. Still not the right shape or likely mechanism to produce such a deep conical penetration into dense heel bone. So, self-inflicted injury, also ruled out. All right, no predators, no self-inflicted wounds. What about just natural accidents? Uh -huh. A rock falling or the sloth stepping awkwardly on a sharp rock? That's another category they had to look at. But again, the evidence doesn't fit. An accidental impact from a rock or being trampled tends to cause irregular fractures, crushing, shattering maybe, not this very precise, clean, cone-shaped hole. The sheer depth and uh, the specific geometry of the mark just doesn't align with random natural agents. It looks targeted somehow. Hmm. You mentioned energy earlier. There was a specific calculation. Yes, and this turned out to be a really critical piece of the puzzle. The researchers actually calculated the amount of kinetic energy required to create that specific indentation in that specific bone. And the number they came up with was about 120 joules. 120 joules? Is that a lot? How do we interpret that number? It's a significant amount of energy, especially <laughs> concentrated into a small point like that. Mm -hmm. To give you some context, uh, estimates for the energy delivered by, say, Clovis spear points thrown with an atlot are often around 100 joules, but that's for a sharp piercing point designed to cut. This mark seems to have been made by something more rounded. Trying to punch a rounded object through thick bone takes immense force. So a thrown spear probably couldn't do this, especially with a rounded tip. Highly unlikely, almost impossible for a human throw to generate that kind of piercing energy with a non-sharp implement into such dense bone. Think about uh, a modern javelin thrower. Record throws generate maybe 400 joules total, but that's about distance and aerodynamics, not punching through bone. This 120 joules calculation was key in ruling out things like, say, a rock being washed against the bone in a flood, or even another large animal stepping on a sharp rock lying on top of the bone. It requires too much focused directional force. They even did some experiments, didn't they? Yeah, there's a note about one of the researchers trying something themselves. They attempted to penetrate a modern cow's femur, which is also pretty tough bone with a sharpened hardwood point. They failed, but then they tried it with a geological hammer and that worked. It just highlights the sheer focused power needed. It wasn't a glancing blow or a simple poke. Okay, so you rule out predators, self-inflicted wounds, natural accidents, even things like typical thrown spears seem unlikely given the energy and the mark shape. Where does that leave us? It leaves us squarely considering human agency as the most plausible explanation, despite the early date. 
And if it was humans, what kind of tool are we talking about? It wasn't sharp, you said. The evidence points towards something with a rounded tip, not a sharp cutting edge. The researchers propose it was likely a hafted implement, meaning a point attached to a handle or shaft. The point itself could have been made of bone or ivory, or maybe that super hardened wood we talked about, attached to a heavy wooden shaft, used perhaps like a thrusting spear, or even a sort of specialized club. And what about that rotation, the striations? Right. The analysis suggested the tool rotated and shifted after the initial impact. They noted a kind of double cavity shape internally. This could mean the tool was twisted or levered after penetration, maybe to widen the wound or dislodge it. So paint the picture. What's the hunting scenario they envision? This wasn't a long distance shot. No, definitely not. The angle they calculated for the penetration, about 60 degrees relative to the ground plane, suggests a very close range attack. How close? Maybe only one or two meters away. Yeah. That's right up next to the animal. This implies a thrusting action, not a throw. Imagine using a heavy spear-like tool, maybe even needing significant upper body strength or momentum to drive it in with that 120 joules of force. Wow, against a giant ground sloth, that takes guts. Uh, or maybe strategy. Or both. The researchers suggest the goal might not have been an immediate kill, actually. Hitting the heel bone like that could potentially immobilize or cripple the hind leg. Ah, a way to disable it first. Exactly. A unique hunting strategy, perhaps, for dealing with such a large and potentially dangerous animal. Immobilize it, then dispatch it. It hints at planning, maybe cooperative hunting. Okay, so if this holds up, the implications are huge. This pushes back solid evidence of humans interacting with megafauna in South America by a massive amount. It really does. The widely accepted consensus, based on sites like uh, Monte Verde in Chile, generally placed initial peopling later. And evidence like the White Sands footprints in North America points to humans around 23,000 years ago. But this is 33,000 years ago in Uruguay. Correct. It challenges those timelines significantly and adds weight to the growing, though still debated, body of evidence suggesting human presence in the Americas before the last glacial maximal. The LGM, the peak ice age period. Right. Roughly 26,500 to 19,000 years ago. If humans were already in South America hunting giant sloths 33,000 years ago, they must have arrived on the continent much earlier than the LGM peak. And what about the site itself, Arroyo del Iscarino? Is this heel bone the only piece of evidence there suggesting human activity? No, and that's important. It's not just this one bone in isolation. The researchers mentioned that the same site has yielded over 40 other megafaunal bones that also show potential cut marks. Some of these marks apparently resemble the type of damage seen on the heel bone. So there's a pattern of unusual bone modification at the site, further pointing towards human megafauna interaction. But what about stone tools? Aren't those the usual calling card for early humans? That's one of the puzzles and a point of discussion. Definitive stone tools are rare in this specific bone bed deposit at Arroyo del Vizcaino. However, the researchers propose that maybe these early hunters relied more heavily on tools made from organic materials, bone, ivory, that hardened wood, things that were readily available right there from the animals themselves. And those wouldn't preserve as well as stone. Exactly especially in potentially acidic soil conditions over tens of thousands of years, organic tools often just don't survive. So the argument is maybe they were saving their valuable stone tools for other tasks like butchering and using these more perishable organic points for the initial hunt or kill. That could explain the lack of stone tools right in that bone layer. Okay, so this finding fits into a much bigger and sometimes contentious picture of when people first got to the Americas. Oh, absolutely. The timing of the initial colonization is one of the hot topics in American archaeology. There's ongoing debate, with sites claiming very early dates in both North and South America. Like what? Well, places like Chicuit Cave in Mexico have produced controversial dates going back maybe 30,000 years. There are sites in Brazil, like Pedro Ferrada, that also have very old debated claims. This Uruguayan evidence adds another significant piece to that pre-LGM puzzle. And is this the only potential evidence for ancient humans hunting sloths specifically? Or are there hints elsewhere? No, it's not the only hint, though perhaps the most direct evidence of a hunting injury this old. There's other, often indirect, evidence. Cut marks have been reported on bones of various other giant sloth species like Megacerium, Glossotherium, even North American forms like Megalonyx from different sites and time periods, though often younger than this. And the White Sands footprints, weren't there sloth prints there too? Yes, exactly. At White Sands, New Mexico, you have those amazing trackways showing human footprints alongside giant sloth footprints dated around 23,000 years ago. 
It looks very much like stalking or harassment behavior. And there are other sites, too, like Elvano in Venezuela, which seems to be a kill and butchering site for another type of giant sloth, Eremotherium. Right. So humans definitely interacted with and hunted sloths later on. This new find just pushes that interaction way back. Okay. But you keep saying, and the paper emphasizes, that this is still a tentative hypothesis. Why the caution if the evidence seems so strong after ruling things out? Well, science demands rigor, especially when you're making potentially paradigm-shifting claims. Tentative here means that while the analysis is meticulous and the conclusion is well supported by the current data, it's still based primarily on one key specimen, even with the other marked bones providing context. It needs more supporting evidence, ideally. Mm -hmm. More studies on those other marked bones from the site, finding maybe associated lithic flakes, even tiny ones, or uncuddling similar evidence at other sites of comparable age. Peer review and replication are key. So more work is needed to really nail it down. Definitely. The researchers themselves call for more study. But... You know, even as a tentative hypothesis, it's incredibly thought-provoking. It really highlights the potential ingenuity and adaptability of the first Americans. Their ability to tackle huge, formidable creatures using potentially sophisticated strategies and tools, maybe even tools made from organic materials we rarely find. So just to kind of wrap our heads around this, we have a single ancient heel bone from a giant sloth in Uruguay. Through really detailed analysis, CT scans, casting, residue checks, scientists identified a unique, deep, conical wound. Mm -hmm. They systematically ruled out natural causes, predator attacks, self-inflicted wounds, based on the mark's characteristics and the immense energy needed to make it. Exactly, about 120 joules. Which led them to the tentative conclusion that humans caused the injury, likely with a heavy hafted rounded tip implement in a close-range thrusting attack around 33,000 years ago. That sums it up perfectly. It paints a picture of skilled, adaptable hunters present in South America far earlier than we used to think. Okay, so here's the final thought to leave you with. If early humans were successfully hunting massive ground sloths 33,000 years ago in South America, what else were they doing? What other parts of the story of the first Americans might we need to rethink? What does this level of interaction this early on tell us about human resourcefulness, our adaptability, and that deep, complex relationship we've always had with the other inhabitants of this planet, especially the giant ones? It opens up so many questions, doesn't it? This deep dive doesn't give us the final answer, perhaps, but it certainly presents us with a thrilling new puzzle about just how early and how resourcefully humans made their mark on the Americas.